we're going into the going into our shiur, and we're going to talk, as I said, about Parashat Chukat. And the topic is the Be'era Shel Miriam, the well of Miriam. This is the topic for tonight. We want to understand deeply what this well symbolizes, and especially in a particular context, which is not often uh, referred to or elaborated. So, uh, how does this? Uh, how is this connected to the parasha? The well. They hold this very famous image of Miriam giving the people of Israel this miraculous well. Is not mentioned explicitly in the Torah. The, it all it's a midrash and it all hinges on a a uh, two verses that come one after the other in this part in parashat chukat and this is the verse telling us very simply very shortly briefly about miriam passing away we're told that she passes away it's probably the only natural death we're told about in the desert all of the other people in the desert they die because of sins including Moshe and Aaron, who don't marry to enter the Eretz Yisrael because of what happens in this parasha. And all the other people, of course, they die because of one sin or another. And the majority of them because of the sin of the, the Miraglim, the spies. But Miriam just, just passes away, just very naturally, out of old age. According to one opinion, she was 127 years old, just like Sarah, meaning she was seven when, Mo, when Moshe was born, and 120 years later, she's 127, and she passes away <coughs> in, the, in the desert. And as we're told that she passes away, the very next verse tells us that there was no water for the congregation, that the people of Israel suddenly had no water. We had a lot of water problems in the beginning of the 40-year journey, but they were solved. They were solved the moment that Moshe, told, uh, that Hashem told Moshe to hit a certain rock, and water came out of the rock, right? The famous story, that's in the very beginning of the journey. And then Chazal tell us, this rock that he hit, and the water came out of it, this was really something that, this miracle, was by virtue of Miriam. We have three shepherds leading the Jewish people out of Egypt, Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. Each one of them has a gift. From, from Moshe, it's the manna bread coming from the sky, from Aaron, it's the clouds and the pillar of clouds that led the Jewish people and guarded them. And for Miriam, it was this well. And the, the miracle about this well was that it was a, a, a non-stationary well. It was, it was moving. It was traveling along with them. It was a rock. It would roll around. And whenever they would stop, it would stop with them, and then water would come out of it. So this is a very beautiful, deep image of... Um, of a something that is, on the one hand, supernatural, because no well is a locomotive well, something that moves. A well is a hole in the ground. On the other hand, the fact that it's water coming from the bottom up, from the ground up, does allude to a natural movement, because when we have the mana bread coming from the sky or the pillar of, of cloud, um, the pillar of smoke, all this is something that has to do with the heavens. But because the well suggests water that is springing forth from below, it, is, it does signify something very natural, this outflow of water from the ground. But it's also supernatural. It's a miracle. It's both. It's very interesting. So we want to understand this image, what this symbol symbolizes and what it means. And we want to focus on one particular thing. And the thing is that we're told in the Midrash that describes this miraculous well, uh, we're told that it would travel around, would roll around um, from wh wh each time they stopped. And each time they camped and they placed the tabernacle in the center with the Ohil Moed, the, the tent of, I don't know if it's translated, the, the tent of the, of the tabernacle. And then around this, would, would all the tribes, all the 12 tribes would surround this. And the well would situate itself in the, in the yard, in the courtyard of the tabernacle, Chatzar Oel Moed. And then each of the 12 um, leaders of the tribes, the Nesi'im, each tribe had a, a leader, the head of the tribe, and they would come, and they would each take their staff, 
right? And staff also means tribe. It's the same word in Hebrew, mate. They would take their staffs and the water would come out of the well. And then they would dig, using their staff, they would dig a channel from the well, which is situated in the center of the camp, all the way to their, each, to their, to their camp. So you had 12 channels coming out of the central well, leading all the way, giving water, flowing water to all the different tribes. And it was so powerful, and the, it was so wide, and the water would constantly flow out of it, that uh, you, you would be able, that's what the Midrash says, you would be able to take a boat and travel. And that's how they could easily travel, because it was a very l large area that they took up when they camped. Because you have 12 tribes, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of people. So they camped out of a very large area, with the tabernacle in the center. And they would need, they have those channels, and those channels brought water, and those channels were also means of transportation. And in particular, this Midrash says, it doesn't talk about the men, it talks about the women. The Midrash says that whenever a woman wanted to visit her relatives or her friends in another tribe, she would get on a boat from the tribe where she lives, and then she would travel. And apparently, and of course, what happens, it wasn't an... A, a, there wasn't a channel leading, connecting each tribe to each and every other tribe. There would have been an amazing network of channels, but it, 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 oh, it went to the center. So it must, they don't say this, but it's obvious. What happened was that they would travel to the center, and then from the center they would travel to the tribe where they want to get to. So this is a very, very interesting concept. And another thing was, before this, is that uh, the, the well would come up, would bring forth water, using a song. That's also mentioned in the Parsha. At the end of the Parsha, there's a short song about a well that comes up. And the Pshat is very different, but in, for, for Chazal, in the Midrash level, uh, this is talking about the well of Miriam. So they would come to the well, to the to rock, and they would sing this song, and it would come up, and the water would start flowing, and then they would dig their channels, and they did this every time, every stop that they had. And then you had these channels connecting them, and the women could travel with the boats. So it's a very, very deep, beautiful image. Um, you can look online for illustrations, classical illustrations of this. Or you can find them in old synagogues and so on. And we want to crack this open. We want to understand what this image symbolizes. What is the concept of, we, we know that there are 12 tribes, and we know that they're all one people. And we want to understand what is this very vital, amazing contribution that Miriam added to this whole thing by, by having this well in the center and those channels interconnecting them. So just to make sure the connection to the parasha is that, again, we learn of this well from Parashat Chukat because it says that she passed away. And then one verse later, it says that they had no water. And from this, Chazal learn that it must be connected the moment she passed away her well passed away or disappeared alongside with her. And that's why, and so this is a very interesting way of explaining this, the, this juxtaposition of the two verses. So, we'll, so that's why they infer, that's how they infer that there was this well in the first place. And then, and then the well comes back. When Aaron and Moshe try to, uh, again, bring forth water from the rock, there's this whole story, they come to a rock, it's the wrong rock, they don't know how to recognize the right rock, and then they speak to it, it doesn't work, they hit it, it's the wrong thing to do, and finally the water comes back, but they do it in such an upside-down way, and they, and, and they hit it instead of speaking to it, and all this is the story of what happens when Miriam disappears. So we want to put this into the fold also. Uh, we have, she had this well, and she was the one who gave this well somehow the power to exist or to be present, as she passed away, the well sort of followed her underground. And then it came back, but it came back in this offside way that really ended up uh, leading to uh, Moshe and Aaron not entering Eretz Israel. They couldn't enter Eretz Israel because they did it in such a wrong way, hitting it, not recognizing it, then hitting it instead of speaking to it. And so the water came back, but they paid a heavy price. And, and this is, again, an image of there being a feminine figure here who had the power to bring in the well, 
But as she left, the men couldn't know, didn't know how to bring this well back in a, in a good way. So there's a feminine, masculine aspect to this whole story very much, right? There's the image of Moshe and Aaron not, 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 not knowing how to deal with the disappearance of the well and trying to bring it back and not doing it in, in the proper way. It's like two men that are left to take care of the baby with the woman gone. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to, how to change it, how to clean it. They don't know what to do. And then they shout at the Jewish people also. The maternal, uh, sisterly, feminine aspect is missing. So that's... That's another thing that's going on in this story. So the way to, to so the, the key to unlocking this image of the, tri the tribes and the well in the center with the channels leading in all directions, making this connection with the, with the woman being able to travel in boats, the key to cracking this open is to, is to remind ourselves of something very simple about Judaism. And this very simple thing is the following, is as, as we all know, Jewish identity, whether you're Jewish or not, is determined by whether you were born from a Jewish mother or not. And if you have a Jewish mother and a non-Jewish father, you're Jewish. But if you have a Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother, you're not Jewish. You're something called Zera Israel, and it has some halachic ramifications. But the identity, the Jewish identity, if I belong to the Jewish nation or I don't, is determined via the mother whether I'm born of a Jewish mother or not. So you could say, well, this is very simple. And many people, you know, more cynical people would say this. That's because that's the only way you can know for sure uh, that they're Jewish. Because, because you, the father, you, you can't be absolutely sure who, who the father is, but you can be absolutely sure who the mother is. But there's something to contradict this. And, and this is the fact that the tribal identity is not set by the identity of the mother, but by the identity of the father. The tribal identity, the tribal lineage, is a patrilineal image, uh, lineage. And the whole idea of the tribe starts with something called Batei Av. Batei Av are uh, paternal units. And if you're born, if you're a man, and you're born into a certain tribe, you will never leave that tribe. That's who you are forever. You're part of that tribe. However, uh, you can marry someone, a woman, from another tribe. So the woman would move from one tribe to the other. They, would, they could marry other tribes. They didn't necessarily have to do so, but they could. At some point, there was this whole story that they stopped doing this. But, but it, was, it was in principle possible. And, and, but the, the, the main thing here is that the Jewish, belonging to the Jewish nation, that is, has to do in some deep way with a feminine, uh, with, 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 again, being born out of a mother, that is, it's determined by who your mother is. It's something that has to do with motherhood, the, the, the identity of the, of the large-scale nation. However, the 12 tribes, each and every tribe, that's a masculine. So we can say that the, the nationality in, in Jewish context, nationality is feminine, but tribalism is masculine, right? And, and, and so let's it, just let's bring, bring in. So no, let's say let, let's let's not. Oh, so, sorry, let's use this now to go back to this image. What happens is now is that we have a the the Jewish people are traveling through the desert. They camp, and they each have their own tribe. And and the tribe isn't just a family or an extended family. The tribe is a lot of things. Each tribe has a flag. Each tribe has a certain verses, blessings of, of um, Yaakov, and later on the blessings of Moshe, and they, and they go with this, and, and it determines sort of their character, it reflects their character. They have their own siddur, their own version of, of the prayers, that's what they have. And above all, it's the flags. I think it's the flag that, I, that very strongly stresses this tribal identity. And of course, we don't have tribes today, but we do have a remnant of this uh, division into tribes in the Jewish people, and that's the division into traditions, into adot, where you have Ashkenazim and Sfaradim, and then you have Hasidim and Litaim, and within Hasidim you have all kinds of tradition, and Judaism tends to break down into all kinds of traditions, and as we know, halachically, if a, very similar to the tribes, if a woman from one 
tradition marries into a marries a husband from another tradition, she accepts she takes on herself his minhagim, his uh, customs. So again, this is a very masculine thing. The division into groups, subgroups within the people, that's a very masculine thing. And, 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 and usually we also see men very much caring about this, about carrying the particulars of the customs, about carrying on the same nusach, the same version of the, of the, the prayers as my father and my grandfather and so on. And, and that goes under the idea of having this kind of flag, which isn't national, it's more particular than the national, but it's, it's very uh, vital. And you, and you also see a lot of arguments going on between this, and that's also very masculine. A lot of arguments, a lot of debates about whose version is better, or whose version is more precise, or whose version is more um, loyal to the, the, the meaning of the Torah, and all this. All this is a very masculine, let's say, energy. But the national identity, the remembering that after all, despite all the flags and the ideologies, by the way, in Hebrew, ideology is a, it's a non-Hebrew word. You say ideologia. But ideologia, it's very similar to degel, flag. So there's a deep connection between degelim and ideologia, flags and ideologies. It's a, it's a, in Hebrew, it's, it's the same root. It's a, it's a play of the same root. So, be, when we remember that beyond the ideologies and beyond the flags, after all, we're all one nation, we're all one people, we all come out of the same, so to speak, maternal womb of the nation, that's a feminine experience. Transcending the division into tribes, into groups, into particular traditions and customs, and remembering that we're one nation, that's that's like, just like you have uh, a mother who sort of collects all the children and says, let's don't fight because we're all one family and we're, and to remind this, well, a lot of times the, the father does this as well, but there's something more maternal about, let's say, let's put our differences aside and remember that we're this one nation. So this is a very basic, beautiful thing to remember about the structure of Judaism is that you have these levels. And as always, it reflects in the language. One of the words for, or the two major words for a nation in Hebrew are le'om, right? Le'umiyut is nationalism. Le'om is nation. Le'umi is national. Le'umani is nationalistic. That's if you want to be pejorative. And another word is umma. Umma is also nation. Both these words, what they have in common is alif and mem, and that's em, that's mother. There's something motherly in the very words of Le'om and of Uma. nation is something motherly. It also connects us to something else, which is that um, it has to do with Emuna. Emuna is three letters, but the Nun in many ways is, is not as vital as the first two. And we can say that the M, the mother principle, unites the umma or le'om, the nation, and also reminds us of the, base, the basic emunah, the basic faith that we all share. So you can be Sephardi, and I can be Ashkenazi, and you can be Lita'i, and I can be Hasidi, and all this, but we all believe in one God. We all believe in Torah Mishamayim, we all believe in, in Moshe, and, and the, eternity, the eternity of the Torah, and all this. There are basic things we all tenets of faith, of emunah, that we all hold on to. So this mother principle is, again, we can see that it unites and reminds us of everything we have in common. And we can even, we can even add another thing, which is that there is, I just heard this story today, that a relative of mine just spent quite a lot of time in the maternity ward. She had this complicated birth, and she was under supervision, and she she um, she spent time she spent time in the maternity ward with a lot of other women who were also giving birth or recovering or on their way to give birth, and the women from all the different tribes, so to speak, of Israel. So you had ultra orthodox, deeply ultra orthodox Hasidic women, and you had totally secular women, and you had women who were Sephardi and Ashkenazi and everyone together, and they forgot completely about their their differences and their why because they were in the situation of giving birth. And that's something so universal, so basic. And so, 
and, and they could just concentrate on this experience of being mothers and about to give birth or giving birth and share experiences and all this. And so we can see this from a lot of the directions, this motherly principle or feminine principle unites. It unites from below in the sense that we're all coming from the same nation and also in the sense that we're all uh, share basic human experiences. It also connects us from above having a shared emuna, shared faith. So we all ultimately, beyond all the differences, we all believe in one God, one Torah, and all this. And also, we have basic experiences putting us together. And also, we're, we're one nation, after all, at the end of the day. So now we're going back to the image of the will putting its, placing itself in the center of the camp. And then all the 12 uh, heads of tribes come, and they dig this channel, they create this channel, and the water connects them. This is an amazing image of how they're all situated in different places, but the, the motherly maternal principle, which is the well of Miriam, Be'er Miriam, actually creates a network of connections, of channels reminding us, connecting us, that we're all drinking from the same well, we're all connected by this water, and we can also travel to one another. We, have to, we can visit. We don't have to be... We're all one people. We, we have tribes. That's a very important identity, the tribal identity, the flags and the different traditions and the different character of each tribe and the different customs. Why? Because it's all aspects and facets of the Torah and of the Jewish people and of the revelation of God in the center, in the, in the tabernacle. It's very important that we have this particular identities. We don't, want, we don't want to throw them away, but we want to make sure that they don't, you know, disconnect. They don't lose touch of one another. So we have Miriam adding this amazing aspect of reminding us that we're all one nation, reminding us that we are all human beings sharing basic experiences, reminding us that we all have this one shared faith, that we're, that we, which is, again, in the tabernacle, that we're connected to this. And the image of the women traveling on boats from one tribe to the other, well, first it connects to the very shot thing, which is, as I said before, if you're a man and you're born to a tribe, you're, you stay in the tribe forever. But the women are able to marry from one tribe to the other. So they really do need to go and visit their parents and their sisters and their friends and where they grew up because they could, they could actually migrate from one tribe to the other. So again, this is also present in here, that the men take care of the tribal identity or the particular customs within the broader context of Judaism. But the women are there to make sure that we're, we don't forget one another, and that we respect one another, that we do all these connections, all these kind of bridging or mediation and, and bringing us all together. It's like a glue, it connects us together. This connects... In, in a very amazing way, to so something we see about the actual person, the character of Miriam. Miriam cannot stand separation. When her father left her mother, after the decree of Pharaoh, that all the sons are to be killed, Amram, the father, left Yocheved, the mother, and he said, and all the, all the, the men followed suit, and he said, if we're the children we give birth to are going to, to die anyway, then let's not bring them. And then she rebuked her father, and she said, you're worse than Pharaoh. And she, she made sure that he would remarry the mother. She couldn't stand the fact that they were apart. She's trying to mediate, to connect the masculine aspect and the feminine aspect. And here it's connecting the masculine aspect of the tribes she cares about. She, she likes the fact that there's tribes. She's not against this. It's not a kind of superficial universe, universality that says, let's, let's all be together and forget their differences. No, it's not forget our differences. It's bridge the differences. She respects the, the masculine tribal identity, but she also wants to make sure that the mother identity and the feminine aspects of, the, of all belonging to one group is there. And the other time she's trying to connect a couple is when she hears that um, there's a, this separation between Moshe, her brother, and Tzipora, her sister-in-law, the wife of Moshe, when she hears that Moshe 
when he became the uh, prophet, when he, when he had to, to go up to Mount Sinai and bring down the Torah, Hashem told him, she didn't know Hashem told him, she just knew that he, he separated from his wife, Tzipora. Again, she was very angry, and she tried to, in her best to, again, reconnect them. It didn't work because it was Hashem's will, but the fact that she tried was another, uh, is another beautiful um, uh, illustration or example of how she's trying to, to connect the tribes. And now we can, uh, another thing we can add to this, again, another element that really strengthens this, is that generally speaking, I, I, I said the women could marry outside of the tribe. It doesn't mean it was very customary. Usually, they did marry inside their tribes. However, there are major exceptions to this that we know for sure. And the exceptions are Miriam and Aaron and Moshe. All three married outside their tribe. Miriam married Kalev. Miriam was, of course, from Levi. All three of them were, were Levites, of course. So, but Miriam married Kalev, who was from the tribe of Yehuda. Aaron married uh, Elisheva, also from the tribe of Yehuda, but it was a different tribe. And Moshe went even farther than that, and Moshe married a non-Jew, a convert, Zipporah, the daughter of, of, of um, Yitro. So now we see, now, now we're, we're going to add another level to all of this. The fact that Moshe went farther than his two older siblings, it starts with Miriam marrying Kalev as part of her ideology, her non-ideological ideology, her ideology of transcending ideologies, her ideology or her worldview that we should not let our tribal identity uh, replace or make us forget our national identity. Then as part of this, she married someone from another tribe and the Haron copied her, let's say, or took her example. And Moshe took also her example, but he went farther than that. And he married uh, someone from another, uh, another people altogether, converting her. So this leads us to the, the next level of all, this, all these ideas. The word for well in Hebrew is be'er. Be'er, that's the Hebrew word, bet alef reish, for well. Throughout the Torah, the, the word appears many times because we have a lot of wells. Um, Eliezer, the slave of Abraham, goes out to search for a wife for Yitzchak, and he meets her, Rivka, next to the well. Later on, it's Yaakov who meets uh, Rachel next to the well. There are wells before this. There are a lot of wells. Abraham digs wells. Yitzchak redigs the wells. There are a lot of wells. Later on, in the book of Dvarim, the same word, Bet Alef Reish, appears for the first time, meaning something completely different. It, suddenly it's a verb and not a noun. And it, it appears when Moshe is giving his blessings to Yoshua. He knows that he's not going to enter the whole land. He knows that Yoshua is taking his place. And he tells him everything he should do on his way to conquer the land of Canaan. And he tells him that once he crosses the Jordan River, he needs to place large stones and paint them white and write the Torah on those stones. And then he uses a particular, a very new uh, phrase. He says, you should write the Torah, Ba'er Heitev. And here the word Ba'er is, is, a, is a verb. And the verb, the translation is to elucidate. To elucidate or explain the Torah well. Ba'er Heitev. This is, this is something that never, never occurred to me. But the word heitev in Hebrew, in English, it's the word well. Well is in the sense of do it well, well done. So this is amazing. I never thought of this until this very instant. So he tells him, ba'er heitev, you should elucidate it well. In English, the word well is the corresponds to heitev. In Hebrew, the word be'er, elucidate, is identical, not in the vowels, but the, the, the letters, how it's written, identical to well. So there's something very interesting going on here, language-wise. So again, the word, the expression is ba'er heitev. Ba'er means to elucidate. Heitev means well, to do it well. And in Hebrew, ba'er, to elucidate, is written in exactly the same way as ba'er well, a, a water well. 
So the fact that it's the same word, that the verb to elucidate, leva'el, bi'ur, bi'ur rashi, right? We use it all the time. Uh, the fact that it's the same, identical to the noun, well, as in the well of Miriam, or any other well, for that matter, says, tells us that this is some, something deeply connected. That in some way, elucidating something is a bit like digging a well. And uh, what, what happens, what, when do you dig a well? You dig a well when, you, when, there, when it's dry, and you don't see water, and then you have to dig in deep, and then you discover a hidden source of water, and that water comes to the surface. That's a beautiful metaphor for elucidating something. You see something, you don't understand it. It's like dry, parched land. You want to understand it. You want to quench your thirst for understanding. You want to, to, to feel the water, the meaning of it. But you can't, you don't see it, so you have to dig. And the digging is like the elucidating. You dig, you dig in because you want to find, you want to discover the inner meaning of it. And then when you hit water, and the water comes forth, that's like the moment of understanding. So not only you, you understand what you, you couldn't understand before. So digging a well, this is something you, we would never have arrived at this unless the Hebrew language would, would have these two completely different things be so connected. So any, just, just the image of digging a well is a bit like elucidating something. If we connect this to the image of the, the well con creating channels connecting the different tribes with their tribal customs and codes and flags and all this, you have another image for elucidation, a bit more like translation. What is to elucidate? It's more like to translate. I have things I do understand, I have things I don't understand, and then a translation is being made, and what I don't understand is translated into the words I do understand, and then it's elucidated, it's translated, so to speak. So creating these channels is like translating the different cultural codes or cultural languages or cultural mindsets of the different tribes. So Miriam, who gave us this well, which created channels connecting the tribes, was, was a mediator, a bridger, a translator of different cultural languages, so to speak. She created, so, so we have two levels now. We have the, the level of just digging a well is like elucidating and creating those channels uh, was also an element of bridging or translating or connecting. But this is where it gets even more interesting. When Chazal tried to understand these two words, Ba'er Heitev, to elucidate well, they ask, what does it mean to elucidate well? What, what, is, what is Joshua expected to do? The, he needs to write Rashi, there's no Rashi yet. And what, what does it mean to, to write it on the big stones and to elucidate it well? And then Chazal say, that what Moshe meant when he said those two words is that he wanted Yeshua to translate the Torah to all 70 languages. That was what he really wanted him to do. look up Rashi, Beshivim Lashon, in 70 tongues. So this is something very interesting. It connects to the fact that the Messianic ultimate goal of all Judaism, of the Jewish revelation, is not for the Torah to be something just national, but for the Torah to be something international. For the Torah to come forth to all the different nations of the world and to unite all of humanity. That all of humanity becomes almost like one people in a way. I shall turn to the nations a clear or clarified tongue. There should be a universal language. It's the rectification of the Tower of Babel that separated all the nations. The rectification is when Torah comes out of Zion, outside of Jerusalem and Israel, and spreads to the whole world and unites all of humanity. And this was left, Moshe left it as a kind of will. He wrote down a will that when he told Yahushua, write the Torah, Ba'er Eitev, well elucidated, write it in 70 tongues, it's like saying the ultimate goal of the Torah isn't just for you to conquer the land of Israel, create a national home, build the temple, all this. That's, that's very much part of it, and that's what you need to do. And you need to banish idolatry and all this. But the ultimate goal, and you should bear this in mind as you're entering the land of Israel, is for the Jewish 
uh, uh, revelation, which is really the, the Torah revelation. It's not Jewish. It's something divine and universal to spread to all the nations of the world and connect them. Now look what's, what's happening. What's happening here is that, again, the word for elucidation is well, and what Moshe is doing here really is he's emulating the model of, the, of Miriam's well situated in the center of the camp, connecting all the tribes, reminding them of their broader identity, the national identity. He's taking this model and extending it from, the, from a, a, a nation with 12 tribes to the level of humanity made out of 70 peoples and that need to have channels connecting them, right? Because translating the Torah into 70 languages it's like creating not 12 streams of the physical water well of Miriam, it's creating 70 streams of the spiritual well of the Torah. The Torah is also a wellspring of wisdom, of divine wisdom. And because it needs to get, it doesn't need to stay just for the Jewish people, there needs to be channels of translation, of communication which are then able to bring forth the Torah into all the 70 nations. So this is an amazing thing. If you just think about this connection between the image of the well placed in the center of the camp, where the tribe of Levi is, we have to remind ourselves there was one tribe in the center. It wasn't just the tabernacle. It was the tabernacle with all the Levites in the center. And then the, the, they would come and, and create channels and then the tribal identities would belong, would be connected to the larger uh, national identity. And, and, is you, and they, would, they would use 12 channels. Now Moshe is doing the same thing on a, on a larger, much more, much more broader, much broader context or level. He is now saying that right now, it's only the Jewish people who have the Torah. Just as within the Jewish people, it was the priestly caste or the Levite caste with the priestly group within it that were in charge of taking care of the tabernacle and the altar and the sacrifices and, and everything that has to do with connecting to God. But, but then you had to, have the, you have to, you have to connect it to all the, different, um, all the different tribes. And he did it with the well and he did it also with the 70 sages that he took from all the different uh, tribes that that's that sort of con that sort of is the bridge between the, the the number twelve and the number seventy of twelve tribes, but you had seventy wise men coming from the different tribes, and but now he's ready as he's about to pass away and pass on the torch to Yoshua, he's now really saying now we have to take this model and emulate it to the level that now instead of the Levi tribe taking care of the tabernacle, we have the Jewish people as a whole. And instead of 12 tribes surrounding it, we have all the 70 nations. And now again, we have to create these channels. So what he's doing is that he's emulating and extending this model. And the ultimate idea that we want to take out of this is that we have here really an amazing model for how, which is all, you know, copyrighted by Miriam. She originated it. And Moshe took it up, adopted it, and extended it. We have a model for how to integrate particularism and universalism. A, an approach that wants to preserve particular identities with an approach that wants to echo and reflect and strengthen a universal identity. So first it starts out in the level of the people. In the level of the people, again, as we said, Having tribes is a wonderful thing because why each tribe is a different set of characteristics and each one brings forth something out of, you know, Jacob, the original father, uh, something in the Torah. They could each, they would complement one another. But we need also to have something connecting them. But we also need to have center. The center is, 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 is one more tribe, but it's a different tribe. It's the tribe of the Levites. And their job is to be in the center, to have the tabernacle there, and to have the well, 
And that's how it's all connected. And why, why is this interesting? Because usually when we're talking about integrating these levels, then as we all know, many people would say the group identity is the most important. You don't have to remember about the larger context. And other people would say, no, 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 let's forget about the groups and think about what we have in common. And then you have the third uh, approach, which says, uh, don't fight. There's room for everything. Let's have a, a picture of a mosaic. We can all have our different particular identities, but also a broader universal identity. But what's missing from all three approaches, of course, the third one is much better than the first two. Again, first one is only particularistic, second one is only universalistic, and the third one is let's, let's have both, like a mosaic. And each stone has its color, but they all create this wonderful picture together. But what's missing is a central point that connects all of this to something higher, something divine. When the, the, the builders of the Tower of Babylon sinned, they worked together. There were a lot of different people. There were 70 nations, and they worked together. And, uh, and, and they, 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 they were a lot of, lot of cooperation. They wanted to work together, but they worked together in order to forget about their divine origin. So Hashem made them split very clearly into 70 groups with different languages. It's not just enough to be working together. It's to be working together, but remembering our common origin. For that, we need a central point re, re, in comparison to which the different particular identities become something of some, become aspects of something really divine and godly and transcendent that, that really unites them in a deep way, not just as coexisting together, but it's creating really a larger whole. So after we have this on the level of the nation, Moshe is trying to now teach us how to do this on a, on a grander scale, on the, on the scale of all of humanity. He's really saying this, by translating the Torah into 70 languages, I echo the fact that there is something called nationalism and different nations. There's the French people and the German people and the Japanese people and the uh, different African people. And, and, and they have their, their particular characteristics. And I... And this is part of, part of, of God's world. There's the 70 languages exist. I want the Torah to be translated into the 70 languages. And only by translating them into all these languages is the Torah elucidated. You can't understand the Torah until you translate it into all the 70 languages, meaning you need the 70 peoples and you need the 70 languages. So we, we want to cherish the particular identity. We're not saying at the end of the days, we want there just to be a Jewish people and all of humanity following it with all their nationalistic identities completely erased. No. The Torah cannot be elucidated until we translate it to all the 70 languages, meaning those 70 identities matter. However, there's also something universal. They need to work together. We need to connect them. This is why we need one Torah to, and channels of translation and communication to connect them and remind ourselves of the broader human identity. We need this also. So now we have the, the, the particular level of nations, and we have the universal level of, of, the, of all being descendants of Adam and Chava, and all being one, one or human, huge human organism. But then we also have, so that's, that's the, the, the approach that says, let's have both the universal identity and the national particular identity. But the, the, the most important thing, which again, it all starts with Miriam's well, is that it's not just enough to say, we're all one human family, but we have different groups, and it's all shades of humanity. If we're, if we're just talking about humanity and its different facets, God is out of the picture. In order to transcend this image of being a global, or there's a word today, Instead of thinking locally and thinking globally, people say, let's think globally. Globally is this combination of globalism and, and, and local communities. But global thinking is, is wonderful, but it's not enough. Because global thinking means the story is about us human beings. We're the story. The universal aspect of us, the particular aspect of us. We're the story, not God. By adding the element that there is a center, that the Torah is in the center, it's the tabernacle, it's the Torah that's in the tabernacle, it's this connection to God, 
mediated, as in the Jewish people, it's mediated by the priests. We are, as a nation, a priestly nation. We're supposed to uh, operate uh, as priests for the larger group of humanity. So having this center, that it's not just all religions are wonderful, all traditions are wonderful, they're all part of the wonderful mosaic of humanity, God is completely lost in this picture. God becomes completely imminent. He's only in us people. He's not transcendent. For the transcendent aspect to be there, there has to be a center where the well is situated, where, where the Torah is situated, where the different channels are not just about uh, experiencing the multifaceted, beautiful face of humanity. It's about seeing all the different national identities and cultures as reflecting facets of the divine. And that's why you need the channel translating the Torah into all these languages. It's, each culture has its own particular music and, and style and energy and vibe and all this. But it's not just facets of humanity, it's facet of, facets of divinity. And this is added by there being the Jewish people and the Torah and, and the Beit HaMikdash and, the, and all of this standing in the center. And then the, the, all these different national identities become reflections of the faces of God, not just the faces of man. So this is our meditation for this week, uh, for Parashat Chukat, understanding, appreciating the amazing chidush that Miriam gave to us when she gave us this well that created this model of integrating the particular and the universal, which then Moshe took up and expanded, extended to the level of all of humanity coming together uh, with, with the Torah in its center. And just a, a tiny little thing to add to this is that the way history played out with Christianity coming out of Judaism and going in one direction, and a few centuries later, Islam coming out of Juda Judaism and extending in another direction created something incredible, which is the fact that the most widely used feminine name on earth is Miriam. There is no other feminine name that's more used historically throughout, the, having one name that you can find all over the place. And it's the most commonly used name is Miriam. So it's Mary and all the different varieties of Mary in Christian world. Mary, Maria, Mary Ann, Mary Sue, whatever. It's all starts with Mary. And in the Islamic world, it's Maryam, a very common Islamic name. So this is a, just an amazing historical fact that somehow reflects the fact that in Miriam herself, although she didn't deal directly with the universal uh, level, she only dealt with connecting the tribes on the national level, but the fact that, it, that it, Moshe extended this, that it was part of her legacy, is played out in history by the fact that her name became the most universally used um, feminine name.